let me tell you good afternoon. Welcome uh, to this uh, webinar organized uh, by Esquerra Republicana and concretely by the post Working Group to be a seminar on uh, Eastern countries and uh, Catalonia in this international context. We are very happy and lucky to have the presence of uh, Jordi Solé and Bogdan Nahailo. Jordi Solé is uh, the Secretary for International Affairs of Esquerra Republicana and MEP, Member of European Parliament, also former Mayor of Caldas de Montbui. And, um, and Bogdan Nahailo is a journalist, historian, and former representative to the United Nations. And of course, we are very glad to have uh, all the, the assistants with us. So uh, we will write down the questions on the chat when you have questions, and then I will, uh, um, I will report these questions to the speakers at the end of the intervention or at the end of a, or, or whatever. This will uh, be the way we will proceed. Now, uh, I will give the floor to Jordi Solé. I think that um, everybody knows him here among our assistants. So uh, he will uh, give his point of view from the European Parliament in reference to these uh, existing tensions uh, between uh, Russia, Eastern countries, and um, all this, um, this context. Uh, and I think in particular on Belarus and uh, Ukraine. So please, Jordi. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for this uh, presentation. Uh, good evening. From, from Brussels, um, and I would like to, to thank the uh, standing group, Esquerra Republicana's standing group on the post-Soviet uh, area, uh, which is one of uh, our uh, working groups uh, on, the, on the international, Esquerra uh, International um, Secretariat, following uh, issues, political developments uh, all around the world, but this is uh, one of the most active uh, standing groups that we have. So I'm very grateful uh, for uh, you organizing this, um, this webinar. And may I also thank, thank uh, Mr. Nahailo for your presence and for accepting this, this invita invitation. We feel very privileged to have you um, tonight with with us. So uh, just just a couple of comments from from my side. Uh, I will be very short and very brief, but maybe just to frame a bit the discussion that we are going to have uh, tonight. Um, the relations between the EU and Russia are re really uh, here in the in the European Parliament and the, in the European Union as a whole one of the main uh, issues uh, right now. You know that tensions have been uh, recently rising, um, especially on the occasion of uh, the Navalny case and the sanctions and counter sanctions uh, between EU and, and Russia. But indeed, this is nothing new. Uh, this has been unfolding during uh, the last uh, years. And I think the, the use the EU Eastern uh, neighborhood um, um, as a whole has been facing in, in recent years uh, strong uh, instability and it's probably the most relevant uh, arena where the rivalry between the EU and Putin's uh, Russia is taking place. The growing uh, Russian assertiveness on one side and the EU's uh, willingness to have some credit as a global player and to, uh, and to um, exert some leverage on its uh, Eastern neighbors. On the other side, both, uh, this, uh, this, both these strategies um, meet in countries uh, like Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, or Georgia. For, for Russia, further econ economic, but especially security and political integration of those countries with uh, the European Union and other Western um, organizations 
for them, this is clearly a, a red line. And uh, the fact that the relations between uh, EU and Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Ge Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, uh, especially since uh, 2009, have been unfolding under a structured uh, umbrella called uh, Eastern uh, Partnership. Uh, this has been also uh, a, a matter of rising tensions between um, the EU and Russia, because uh, at the end of the day, Russia still sees these uh, countries somehow as its own uh, backyard. Um, so, uh, in the wake of uh, Russia's annexation of uh, Crimea and the launching of, the, of a, an hybrid, hybrid war in eastern, eastern Ukraine in 2014, uh, the EU decided to step up this relationship with uh, the Eastern Partnership, with these uh, six uh, countries. And um, there have been many agreements, uh, association agreement, agreements, um, free trade agreements um, between these countries, all these, co these countries except uh, Belarus. Um, but Russia perceives uh, this Eastern Partnership as an at attack against its national strategic uh, interests. And moreover, all of these countries have experienced uh, turbulent political developments over the last years. And, and two of them are clearly authoritarian regimes, uh, Belarus and Azerbaijan. All of, the, of these countries, the countries of the Eastern Partnership, all of them have, um, all of them again, except Belarus, have territorial disputes. Ukraine with Crimea and, and, and Donbass, Moldova with uh, Transnistria, Georgia with South, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, mm -hmm. and Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, with Nagorno-Karabakh or, or Arsad. And in all these conf conflicts, uh, Russia, Russia has been one of the uh, fighting sites and keeps uh, troops on the, on the ground. Even nowadays in Nagorno-Karabakh as uh, peacekeepers. Uh, uh, the Russian army uh, is there as the ones uh, granting uh, the peace, the peace uh, agreements. So this tension between the EU and, and, and Russia um, keeps uh, these countries like caught uh, between uh, these two uh, these two spaces, uh, the, the, the Russian space and the, and the EU space. This is a, this is a matter of um, conflicting, conflictual uh, relations. From all of these countries, uh, from all of the countries uh, being part of the Eastern Partnership, probably the one most uh, leaning towards the West is uh, Georgia. I would like to know the opinion of Mr. Mihailo about, about that. Um, but Georgia um, has been uh, doing everything to be part of NATO for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, this includes uh, military and civilian reforms, reaching the uh, NATO's 2% uh, defense spending target, uh, contributing uh, to international uh, NATO missions. Everything uh, has been done from the side of Georgia. And still, they are not members because uh, NATO feels that um, Georgia becoming, uh, finally becoming a NATO member could be, could be, uh, could cause a strong reaction from the side of, of Russia. And when it comes to the European Union, it's more or less the same. Uh, in the 2017 Georgian constitution, it is an enshrined in the constitution that the government, that the government and the political uh, institutions of uh, the Georgian state have to pursue um, membership in the, in the European uh, Union. But none of this um, has happened uh, so far. But of course, this, um, this, um, uh, attitude, this uh, strategy 
of Georgia, trying to get closer to the to the West, is also um, a major topic in the relations between between Russia and the European Union, as we have seen during the last um, political crisis in in Georgia, where the European Union and and precisely the 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 president of the European Council played a, a role in trying to uh, keep um, things calm in in Georgia. So this is, uh, as a matter of introduction, um, my statement from, from, from an MEP, from a member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. Um, this is a very serious uh, uh, concern from the European Union, uh, from our institutions, because uh, it's a bit, uh, a bit the same uh, than is happening with uh, other assertive powers like uh, China, the Russian um, grip towards its backyard uh, is really a matter of uh, concern from uh, the EU institutions. But I will leave it here uh, and let's uh, listen uh, to what our special guest uh, has to say uh, tonight very, very attentively. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, uh, Jordi. Just first reactions before Sonia uh, leads the uh, discussion. Look, I uh, fully agree with you. Look, it's a very uh, uh, difficult time for Europe and its neighborhood. Uh, things are in flux. Who would have imagined in 2021 that we would have a situation like this? And uh, I would just say that uh, uh, what we are witnessing as a preamble to what I will say before, I don't know if this is seen uh, clearly in Brussels, but for me as a historian, not somebody you know British or Ukrainian by origin, but somebody looking at events, we are seeing the new reconfiguration of Europe slowly. We've had Brexit. Britain has left. It has remained loyal because of NATO and is, is, is a key player in supporting democracy movements in the East. Uh, we are seeing in the East of Europe a reconfiguration in the sense that Eastern European states, Lithuania particularly, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, uh, Hungary to a lesser extent because of their own internal politics, Romania, the Czech Republic recently, they somehow feel left out. They feel that there is this tendency now that Britain has left, that Berlin with French support dominates, though Macron has distanced himself in the last two or three weeks from this uh, very aggressive idea, aggressive, I, I say in inverted commas, of, of European autonomy vis-a-vis -vis America. And we still don't know what the Biden administration will deliver at the end of the day because they started off promising a lot of uh, resoluteness vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, but we've seen with uh, the response to Nord Stream 2 and well, let's let, hold on a second, let's talk first. Okay, so let's, let's be forbearing and let's, let's, uh, let's be optimistic that uh, the talks between Putin and, and Biden in the next weeks uh, on the 16th of June or whatever produce uh, decent results or at least reestablish the ground rules and set the terms. What I'm worried about is that in this reconfiguration of Europe, you have on the one hand Eastern Europe with members of the EU and those aspiring to be members of the EU like Ukraine, Georgia, and Georgia has certainly done its homework. Uh, Ukraine has learned a lot from Georgia. Saakashvili, as you know, has been very active in Ukraine with dual citizenship. And as a president has in injected a lot of his experience into that situation. But I think the real problem is that in Eastern Europe, philosophically, historically, we are dealing with unfinished business. We are still at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th. Those processes that happened with Austria-Hungary's collapse, with parts of the Russian Empire's collapse, 
with the British Empire collapsing, with the French Empire, etc., are still slowly, very, in a very delayed way, taking part in Eastern Europe. And therefore, the significance for me of Belarus is that it is that perhaps the last piece in that European jigsaw that is trying to identify itself with Europe. A year ago, I would have said, look, they are in between Russia and Europe. But given the full-hearted support of Putin for Lukashenko and the repressive means, barbaric means by today's standards in Europe, you know, I think your average Belarusian has no doubts where they want to be for the future, not simply for economic reasons. And just to conclude this preamble, I think what we have today also in Europe is on the one hand, kind of double standards vis-a-vis -vis the East, vis-a-vis -vis Catalonia, vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, we need to maybe not reinvent Europe, but we need to reassert European principles and values because uh, somehow business interests, national interests, though masked by pan-European unity have, have taken hold of us. And unless we survive as a community of European nations, large or small, who base ourselves on those core European values, we face immense threats, not just from Russia today, but from China tomorrow, et cetera. And from our own, like in the Roman empire, from our own internal collapse because of our own sort of decay, uh, cynicism, tiredness, laziness, etc. So I would say uh, that uh, what I want to emphasize is that Europe is at a moment of truth, challenged by the East, by Eurasia, but challenged internally also. And not knowing to what extent the US will be consistent and back us to the end as as a European uh, conglomerate of families, as was the case in the 50s or the 60s, you know, the Marshall Plan, NATO, the umbrella in the skies. Because, okay, perhaps many of us welcome that Biden has reaffirmed the interest to be a partner of Europe, which was not so clear with his predecessor. But, okay, three or four years down the road, where does that lead us? So in terms of how we strategically face the future, it's very important right now to make the, the right decisions and show the solidarity and common understanding of core values. Sorry for being so long in this introductory remark. No, thank you very much, Bogdan. I, I just thought I would have to introduce you at the end. It's, it's a joke. <laughs> But, uh, but um, if I wanted to introduce you, it's because I wanted that uh, people who don't know you um, can know you a little bit and be uh, sure that you are the perfect person. To Sonia, know. just for your, Sonia, just for your audience, yeah. I'm of Ukrainian origin. I was born in Britain. I have a lot in common with hundreds of thousands of Catalans who were refugees after the third after the civil war, et cetera. I was born, uh, born in Britain to respect my culture, my language, politically to identify with that state that it seemed impossible in the 70s or the 60s or, or, or early 80s, Ukraine becoming independent, Soviet Union collapsing command. And for many of you, Franco's regime, yeah, okay, you expected his, his death at some stage, but what would happen afterwards? So there are a lot of parallels and I empathize very much with you. But what I want to say is that after that, as a result of that, human rights were very important for me. I worked for Amnesty International for four years in London in the Secretariat. I was responsible for uh, the Secretariat dealing with Soviet, not just Ukrainian, Jewish, Russian, Georgian, Baltic, etc., cetera, uh, prisoners of conscience when Sakharov was in exile, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, the notion of human rights is indivisible. You know, uh, human rights cannot just be for Ukraine. They cannot just be for 
Chilean victims as in the past. They have to also pertain to Catalonian uh, victims of um, injustice and uh, Europe has to get its act together. And so that is my kind of starting point in my assessment of the situation. Yeah, right. And, I, and, I think and then I worked for the UN for 20 <laughs> years in places like Angola, Azerbaijan, Belarus, etc. Different with refugees, with the High Commissioner for Refugees. So let's say I've seen a lot. I've been to a lot of places. But at the end of the day, principles should remain firm. We should not be wishy-washy about them. Okay, so um, I wanted to introduce you, but I think that you you already explained a lot of uh, things about your career, about your life, that, so that people understand that you are really the perfect person today to talk about all this that we are going to, to talk about. None of us are perfect. Well, well I think yes. Let's say, uh, appropriate. Let's say, let's say almost perfect. Um, anyway... I want to thank you also, Jordi told you, but uh, it's a real privilege and a great pleasure to have you here with us. So I think um, after this uh, preamble, as you said, maybe we could start speaking uh, concretely about tensions in, in Europe and maybe with the last event in Belarus that you already mentioned. But uh, what do you think uh, in, uh, we... What is happening there? We know what is happening there, but what do you think can happen or can, which is your forecast for the, for the next uh, situation? Okay, there? Sonia, I will stand back. I'm not going to go into details. We should know the details, those of us who are interested. Look, I think we may have reached a certain turning point in the last week or two, particularly with this Ryan uh, um, sky hijacking by Lukashenko's junta. Uh, I thought that the detonator had already been uh, through the Navalny case, because even the skeptics or those who prefer to sort of move very slowly, uh, whether in Germany or in France in particular, um, you know, uh, and give Putin the benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to call it appeasement. It's kind of doing business and yet speaking up about human rights violations, as the Germans keep putting it up over Nord Stream 2, you know, business is business, politics is politics. But at the end of the day, the two, as we've seen from history, are very closely connected and you cannot separate them. And I've emphasized in some of my recent articles that the, the problems with Germany and Russia read Soviet Union began not with the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact of 1939, the collusion, the active cooperation began in 1922 when democratic Weimar Germany reached an agreement on trade with Soviet Union, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union as it was becoming. And yet behind that, there was this cooperation in the military sphere. I mean, who knows now that before Hitler, the German army was being developed, trained, developing its weapons in the Soviet Union, in an enemy state ideologically. So, you know, we, we, we should uh, also factor in what collusion and appeasement, uh, seemingly pragmatic today, leads to tomorrow. What can be the, the example? And hence the example also for Catalonia. You remain silent today about you know, the fact that uh, immunity is lifted from deputies, that uh, um, referendums are not recognized, etc. Where does this lead to? Uh, five, ten years down the road. Anyway, so um, for Belarus, I think Belarus has been a, 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 tr a new trigger. It has somehow shaken up Europe and America and made them realize that, listen, hey, this is very serious. Uh, because, you know, Ukraine, very serious. Crimea, Eastern Europe, but it's seven years ago. The plane that was shot down is seven years ago, eight years ago almost. And in Europe, Western Europe, people don't care. They don't follow. They're not even aware that the war is going on. And suddenly in this instance, you know, a European plane, uh, Irish uh, 
flying uh, to, to, to Vilnius to an EU member is, is brought down so that uh, a dissident um, journalist can be uh, arrested. So it provides, in a sense, a window of opportunity because if that shaking up of memory and of a sense of responsibility has occurred, then that is very good. You know, it may last for a week, it may last for a month. That's why this week, this month is very important in terms of will the EU actually follow up now, finally, after talking about serious sanctions, I don't mean declaratory sanctions, will they actually impose sectoral sanctions or other? We, that remains to be seen. How will the NATO summit respond to Georgia, Ukraine, etc.? Will it be, thank you very much, here's another package of proposals for preparation, but wait another five or 10 years. You know, we don't know. We need concrete signals. Are we a community of shared values or are we a community of nations, not nations, of states with self-interest predominating where this self-interest, you know, uh, overlaps in, in many cases. So uh, just the bottom line on Belarus, look, let's give them credit. One year, one year of peaceful, heroic, um, new type of peaceful protests, massive initially and certainly for, for many, many months. And on the other hand, the very crude, barbaric, harsh methods that have been used by a system that could only do it if it had the support of Putin. And therefore, again, we need to look at things comprehensively. It's not Belarus, it's not Lukashenko, it's that world, that civilizational mode, that Eurasian approach to human rights, self-determination, to this is my corner of the world, this is my sphere of influence, etc. If we don't factor that in, we will be misled. And uh, hybrid warfare, manipulation of information, uh, the wrong information, the distorted information ca coming out will influence your readers and viewers just as they do still in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine or elsewhere. So if you want uh, what has happened in Belarus, uh, has been, um, I think, a short-term temporary victory for the forces of democracy because it has meant that though one individual and his girlfriend that were captured and taken hostage, and uh, I hate to think what they're going through. On the other hand, it's again focused the world on what's happening in Belarus. But remember, you remember in Ukraine when the uh, Malaysian aircraft was shot down and sanctions were introduced and there was uproar for, for a month or two or three. Afterwards, sanctions have continued, great. But on the other hand, they have not been decisive sanctions. They've not gone into the sectoral areas. They've not gone into swift uh, money transfers or whatever. They've held back. And I think what we are at at this stage, at this stage also of what I described as the reconfiguration of Europe, is Europe refining, uh, refining itself and redefining itself. What are we about? Are we just a conglomerate of, of, uh, of states uh, for whom it's convenient to do business with and some gain grants from and some gain money from, etc. Or we, do we represent a civilizational value, a civilizational yardstick, benchmark for, for others? I'm sorry, Bogdan. You said um, uh, a kind of victory uh, of the forces of democracy. Uh, I, you're right. But uh, objectively, which uh, possibilities you think uh, have these forces of democracy to win in this context so uh, complicated with the pressure of uh, Putin and Russia and Belarus. Um, what do you think 
this can be Look, have a I'm good... an optimist. I'm a I'm a I'm a very cautious optimist. I was born in Britain. I told you of Ukrainian parents. I could never imagine that this huge empire with nuclear missiles and tanks, the Soviet Union would one day collapse, would implode. You know, uh, I worked for Radio Liberty from 1984 to 1994. I remember as a boy reading George Orwell's 1984 when that was still ahead of me, 1984. And I thought, oh my God, we're gonna be in 1984 soon, you know? 1984 occurred, and just a few years later, the Berlin Wall collapsed, <coughs> the Soviet Union collapsed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Putin is not eternal. He's a human being, and Lukashenko. Heart attacks happen, diseases happen, pal palace putches happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We cannot foresee what is going to happen tomorrow, but we can foresee that the ferment is there. Belarus which was a very, let's say, relatively docile country, given the character of its population, law-abiding, uh, you know, uh, wanting to get on with life, not to get involved in politics necessarily, but whose leaders had been either killed or imprisoned by Lukashenko before. And this is a political na European nation that has suddenly I wouldn't say awoken, but has suddenly said in the last year, enough, hey, and we have a voice too, and we want to be heard vis-a-vis -vis initially Lukashenko, vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, but I hope Europe is hearing that. And that's why I say we are looking at a kind of uh, very delayed reconfiguration of Europe. Look at the West. The Brits were never really part of Europe. You know, splendid isolation in the 19th century, special relations with uh, the US. Yes, one foot in if it's financially, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, is, was the, what is the opportun opportune? Uh, in the past, you know, we will pay uh, our allies to fight against Napoleon and then et cetera, et cetera. The thing is that we are seeing a kind of Europe that is being formed that needs to be crystallized around core values and the right leadership. If we permit the kind of leadership that Merkel and to a large extent Macron have offered in the last year or two where business first, national interest first, and yes, lip service to uh, pan-European ideals, uh, we're losing. We're going to lose the game. Uh, we need, I think, with the help of the injection of the energy and the commitment from Eastern Europe to reinvent this Europe. Remember, Europe was about no more war. France, Germany, yes? Trade, etc. But war has continued. War exists on our borders, etc., and political imprisonment, you know, intolerance continues. So uh, it's time to kind of review the situation and, and, and see what's happening. You know, in my bolder arguments, and uh, Jody, I don't know what you think of this because you're you're you know uh, a European MP. I consider that in today's day, we have to avoid piecemeal approaches, as I've said earlier in the program, um, Crimea, okay, we need to support the Crimean platform. We need to um, oppose uh, Russian uh, military intervention and dominance in Eastern Ukraine. Um, it's military intervention and propping up of, of enclaves in Georgia or in uh, Moldova, yes. But at the end of the day, what we need, if we had people with foresight and the guts to say it, is a comprehensive approach to dealing with Eurasia, with Putin's model of autocracy, as opposed to a European model of democracy with all its failings. And I factor in, uh, I know who I'm talking to, 
etc. But if we had, for example, like in 1975, the Helsinki Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, if we got together the states to sit around and say, what is Europe? What is Eurasia? What divides us? What are the compromises and what are the bargains? But listen, we need to draw a clear distinction. Russia, don't think that Ukraine, Moldova and Belarus are yours. Their self-determination say they are part of things. We will tolerate and do business with you and we will tolerate your system and not even comment too much about it. But on the other hand, we don't want your subversive activities, your uh, constant cyber attacks and, and attempts to influence uh, things. You know, at the beginning of the 21st century, we're still in the early part of it, to kind of draw the red lines and also to, 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 to point to where the bridges are, where we can cooperate. You know, 1975 was very big. I was still, you know, I was active as a journalist, the young journalist, but 1975, you imagine the West Cold War sat down with Brezhnev's regime and then the communist bloc and said, okay. And they recognized uh, a human rights basket, which allowed the West to, to, to defend dissidents, etc. cetera. No, I'm not gonna comment about how effective it was but at least it laid down a principle. We have that missing now because there are no rules of the game. Putin and his uh, cronies, Lukashenko, are doing whatever they choose to do. Take a plane down, interfere with elections, uh, arrest people, kill people, poison people, whatever. Whatever the failings and the faults in the West, and I know our complex history too, and I'm not whitewashing anything that's happened you know, in the West in the last 50 years uh, or in, in the state's policies. Uh, but I think this is really what is called for right now because otherwise through this, um, let's say through what, what I've described as this hybrid warfare, but disinformation where half truths are perpetuated and there are half truths. There are half truths. Lavrov talking about, you know, sort of um, how can uh, you teach us about what to do with Navalny when you uh, when you imprison uh, Catalan uh, politicians in Europe? Yes, there is a half truth there, an important one. But in what you know, um, it's Spain, shall we say? Uh, distorting justice to serve the centralist interests of Madrid, as opposed to actually trying to poison your guys, denying it, and then arresting them when they come back. I mean, there is a difference, or Crimea, for example, a, a pseudo referendum, but I don't have to convince you. There are genuine referendums, as you try to do, where uh, you uh, actually do it democratically and you, you appeal to the people to come out and vote and make their opinion known. And there are referendums, so-called, at gunpoint, where parliaments are taken hold of, as in Crimea, and then people are told to vote what they want. And, you know, ex post facto is justified as an expression of self-determination. What do you think, uh, now you were speaking about Lavrov when he said um, this, to uh, uh, this uh, sentence about uh, uh, Catalan political prisoners, um, which is the Russian strategy uh, behind uh, this, um, this kind of uh, declarations? Look, I think it's quite simple. We don't have to be profound. Russia, under Putin in his second stage, because early Putin after Yeltsin, they were still talking about a Europe from... Uh, you know, from Vladivostok until uh, to, to Ireland. You know, what happens happened in between? What are the motives that has uh, led Putin and his gang, his bandit gang, to uh, promote this image of Russia as somehow beyond the law, different, different rules apply, different rules internally, at the same time, you know, making money from oil and uh, connections with the West, uh, money, 
uh, money laundering in London or, or Frankfurt or whatever it is, you know, and uh, getting, you know, Schroeder on board to, to Gazprom and, uh, and, and whatnot. So, you know, obviously money talks, but at the end of the day, Russia has gone into its own different mindset where the church atavistic, the Russian Orthodox Church is used to prop up political bandits, in effect, oligarchs, right? Many more than even in Ukraine. And where, okay, in Moscow, people have made it, they are rich, but the average Russian in the provinces, you know, what age are they living in, etc. And this promotion of the West as an enemy, as somebody who's out to get them, I don't think anybody in the West is interested in getting Russia. They're interested in having civilized relations and not having aggravation, you know, on, on, on the borders, et cetera, et cetera. Your average German, I think, wants to make his money and, and not have to hear about, oh, bloody hell, Putin, more sanctions, which means belt tightening for us, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, we are still 21st century. We are still at the stage where Russia was at in the 19th century. When you read the works of Custine, French traveler, or others, why did we have a Crimean War in the 1850s? Not just to defend uh, the sick man of Europe, Turkey, but because even the French, 40 or 50 years after Napoleon had lost to the, the Russians and the Alliance, and the Russians were in Paris, were fighting against thing, uh, uh, the, the Russians and realizing that this was the, you know, uh, self-declared gendarme of Europe and uh, was imposing its values. Poland knows very well, you know, Poland's existence uh, was thing. So at the end of the day, let's not lose sight of historical parallels. Let's see things in context, but at the, the same time, let's be courageous in the decisions that we take. Let's call things by their names. Let's not bullshit. Let's not appease. And that's what really happens, which brings us perhaps to another part of the, of the, of the discussion. Fine. Um, there is a question from Jordi Villanova, our friend, who says, Mr. Nahailo talks of Eurasia as the Russian Empire, to which nationalists like Putin believe Belarus and Ukraine belong as part of the greater Russia. How long will the empire, empire hold? It will hold for as long as the Russian public is not saturated with democratic ideas and principles. And you know, doing that in Russia is very difficult, especially now as, as more control has been taken over the media, the internet, over foreign agents, so-called, etc. So it's very difficult because on the one hand, the official ideology and propaganda feeds them this idea that they are somehow different, they are somehow greater, that they are somehow entitled to a different set of rules and to do as they want in the areas that they want, you know? Uh, so. I mean, this still stems from, from 1945, the foundation of the UN, the altered agreement, uh, et cetera. Um, the UN, we were supposed to be equals as partners, but the Soviet Union interpreted its own way under Stalin. Yalta, you know, let's split Europe, uh, almost like the, the Nazi Soviet non-aggression pact. This is ours, that's yours, but out, don't interfere, et cetera. Uh, okay. That came to an end with the Berlin Wall collapsing, Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, et cetera, et cetera. And notice that the most, shall we say, staunch defenders of Europeanness in terms not only of business and visa-free travel, but in terms of values, are those countries that had spent a long time under Russian slash Soviet rule. Why is this? This is not NATO expansionism. This is not NATO forcing them or, or, or dangling economic carrots before them. It's simply that 
along with the uh, aspiration to a better um, material life, there is this notion of freedom. Whereas Eurasia, for me, and uh, for those who wrote in the 19th century, it's still part of this oriental despotism. It's still part of this, <coughs> shall we say, um, uh, legacy from the Tatar Mongol uh, era. Remember, Muscovy spent 300 years under the Muscovites. They were totally divorced from, <coughs> sorry, uh, from uh, Europe as, as we know it, as, as we knew it then. So um, Biden has a point. Reagan dared to call the former Soviet Union the evil empire. We know the shortcomings, failures, the crimes that were committed in the West, even under Washington's flags. But at the end of the day, the evil empire that hit home, it was an evil empire. And we still have that today. Uh, Biden, you know, had the, uh, the guts to be forced into acknowledging that, that uh, Putin is a killer, uh, grudgingly, uh, not forcefully like, like, like Reagan. But that sent a message home that I think to Putin, game over, listen, the emperor has no clothes, or at least we know the armor that you are wearing without clothes. And so how long will it last? I don't think that this is a question for us. It might take longer or shorter. None of us know. As I said with the Soviet Union, none of us could foresee when the Soviet uh, Union thing. Remember Monty Python? No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. No one, pardon me, but nobody expects the end of huge monolithic systems like this. And look at, look at what Putin is doing. He's used his economic control uh, to uh, buy supporters, to build up a strong security force and military force. He's kept the nationalities and the regions in check in the one area that challenged Russia after Yeltsin, Chechnya, very bloody, uh, shall we say, reprisals, uh, almost, you know, wiping out that whole uh, generational elite that wanted independence and putting Kadyrov in that place. And for the moment, he seems to be, uh, I would say, well, he seemed to be a year or two ago fully in control. But after what we saw in Khabarovsk, with Navalny, though I'm not sure that Navalny is going to be the, the final trigger. Navalny is problematic in his own way. But I think people in Russia, given declining economic standards linked to the price of oil and not only, but looking at the greed, looking at the stupidity of isolating the country from the outside world, uh, are and through access to the social media, therefore having access to independent media, if, if they are equipped to deal with it, are saying, hey, this, this is not what we were promised. This is not the Russia we want. What's in it for my children afterwards, etc." cetera. I, I, I agree with you, I think, yeah. Really, I, you know that I used to work with uh, Russia and, and all these countries, and uh, there is a proudness to be Russian, always, it's true. But there is also a real desire to, to get mixed with the others and to have the same uh, style of life and opportunities than the others. Uh, so uh, in, uh, com in, com in that sense, the commercial side uh, helps uh, to this possible integration or maybe this uh, decline of the empire. I don't know uh, how to say Sonia, this, but, but remember, just as an afterthought, the imperialistic element here, there is one message to the outside world, Europe, the US, NATO, the confrontation, but to the immediate neighbors of Russia, it's a very imperialistic revised line. Um, you Catalans remember that uh, you wanted to be recognized at least as a nation uh, after the death of uh, Franco 
uh, and for that to be enshrined in all the um, statutes on autonomy or whatever. Putin to this day talks about Ukrainians and Belarusians as one people. We have a separate language like you have from, from, from the Spanish, right? We have a separate history. We have links with other entities, political entities in our past. That is nothing for him. For him, you are one people, you have been badly influenced by the West, whether Austrians in the 19th century or the Poles in the 20th century, but you are really Russians, you know? So you are really Spaniards is the message. Uh, and uh, it's, it's pathetic, shall we say, that uh, in the 21st century that this is happening at two ends of Europe. You know what I mean? That's why I return to having these core values and deciding on who we are at and what, what are the ground rules and what does it mean to recognize self-determination. Uh, self-determination is not just about what the metropolis decides out of self-interest, but in terms of real genuine self-determination as defined maybe in the UN or in the UN uh, bodies, uh, etc., as in courts that are not under the uh, uh, control of the capitals with a vested interest. We have, uh, Bogdan, we have another question from our friend, Alena Turava, who says, I would like to know the opinion of all of you about the way, steps, which Belarusian people could win this struggle with dictatorship. Is it possible to win peacefully, paralyze the country, or take radical steps? Well, let me give Jordi a chance to, to think. I see he's lost in, discuss, in thought there. I think they have already won. It's a question of time. Last year was a turning point, August. Belarus is not the same. The, polit the level of political consciousness has risen. Uh, Belarus has redefined itself as a modern European political nation. Maybe a year ago, it was not quite sure whether it should tilt west or east, not out of political reasons, but maybe out of economic pragmatical reasons, given dependence on energy and, and subsidies for, from, from the east. But given the support, wholehearted, cynical support that Putin has been showing for a murderous regime, let's call it that, a murderous this regime, <clears throat> then I think that even those who have doubted realize that the option is no longer an Eastern one or balancing, that as soon as they get rid of this dictator, they will look to the West. I'm very encouraged that finally Europe, the EU, has dangled this carrot, which is, it has spoken of before, but this three billion incentive is very important psychologically because speaking to a lot of Belarusians, they, they felt that, well, who cares in the West? Our criticism of them was, why didn't you have sort of pro-European bands or, or flags to start with, etc. You were very careful. Okay, that's a plus. But now uh, you see that there is an interest in you developing a democratic approach to your self-determination and that the West is standing by to help you somewhere down the road. I think that that has been a very encouraging signal, even more so than, than some of the sanctions that were applied before the Ryan Air um, incident. Jory? Sorry, I, I couldn't uh, unmute myself. Um, in, in Belarus, we have a dictator uh, being bad, but by uh, an aut autocrat uh, from one of the biggest countries in the, in the world. When that happens, um, it's difficult to get rid of um, dictators, but there are things that can be, can be done. Uh, first thing uh, has to be the internal struggle that uh, Belarusians uh, are 
are, are doing, uh, which is uh, absolutely commanding. Um, they are trying to um, resist the authoritarian uh, grip, the criminal grip of, uh, of a regime. And this is uh, something which is um, very difficult to do and to sustain over 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 the time. So we have to help. We have to help them. We have to help the civil society, the democratic forces that uh, in Belarus are risking their lives um, because they want freedom and they want to live in in, in dignity. And this is uh, one of the things that we can do from from the European Union um, and from the from the ups, outside to give our um, full support to those to those many in in Belarus actively uh, resisting this uh, dictatorship and that can be done uh, in in different ways um, from the European Parliament and this is this is a very transversal cross-cutting um, support um, there is a clear, a clear uh, willingness to keep putting pressure on the Belarusian uh, regime. Uh, we were the first uh, to call for sanctions, to call for more sanctions, because at the, at the beginning, um, the member states were hesitating whether to go the hard line or you know, uh, procrastinate, procrastinate a little bit, which is very, very European, may I say, very EU way. Uh, in the end, there were sanctions, but I think that there is more to be done on on that on that level. But there has to be direct support to the Belarusian civil society and democratic movement. And uh, for instance, uh, this is a very very small uh, example, but. Uh, I just signed uh, this afternoon uh, a letter that most probably will be joined by, by many MEPs. MEPs requesting uh, the EU to send um, officials to witness the political trials that uh, are going to take place uh, there. So um, this this might be this might seem uh, very very little uh, or nothing, but. Uh, by having um, a direct EU presence, if it's possible, in these uh, trials, we are uh, showing that uh, we care uh, about them. We care about what's going on there and that we also want to uh, help Belarusians um, resisting and uh, overcoming this uh, dictatorship. Huh? Um, but... I was, as, a, as I was saying at the, at the beginning, let's face things uh, straight. Um, as long as uh, Lukashenko has the active, very active support from, from Putin, uh, it won't be easy. But at the same time, I think um, dictators do many stupid things. And uh, Lukashenko, with this, the story of the Ryanair flight, uh, really did uh, a very stupid thing and probably he crossed uh, a, a red line because I had the impression that for the last couple of weeks or months, the democratic revolution in Belarus was something that seemed from out, from the outside was a bit uh, forgotten. And now with this uh, kidnap kidnapping, uh, the issue is getting back to the to the agenda and to the public opinion. So that was really a um, bad move from, from Lukashenko. Um, but yes, we, we, by all means, we have to keep putting uh, pressure uh, on, the, on the regime with, with sanctions, with other kind of leverage that we can have and we do have from the European Union and having um, direct support to, to, the, to the civil society, to the democratic uh, movement. Let me just add, I, I think it's very commendable that you want to witness trials, etc. But I think, excuse me for my frankness, I think it's very naive. Remember the OSCE way back last year had invoked the Moscow Memorandum about sending missions to, uh, uh, to OSCE states uh, if there were such uh, big problems, if there was the majority of votes that 
it were, which would override any vetoes that Russia and its partners would put in. Um, Belarus will not let you in, uh, witness these uh, trials uh, because they don't consider them trials. Uh, and then uh, responding to, to the question I just read it, I don't think radical methods, I don't think going out like in Ukraine where the protests were centered in, a, in the heart of Kiev on the Maidan and where there were, you know, shall we say, uh, barriers built, etc. And where, let's face it, the Yanukovych uh, uh, regime, however harsh it was, it was not as cruel. It was not as ruthless as what we have seen uh, happening in Belarus. Had Yanukovych used that sort of force, you know, brutal force, shooting people down initially, taking in the bulldozers, arresting people massively, etc. I don't know if the Maidan would, would, would have occurred. Uh, and, so, and thirdly, I think that, you know, um, what is necessary is for joint solidarity from Europe. But I think as European parliamentarians, you should press on some of, at least one of uh, Belarus's immediate neighbor, Ukraine, to apply sanctions, not just with airspace, but to stop dealing with diesel and petroleum, et cetera. There's a lot of trade going on still that keeps the Lukashenko regime alive. And that is also hypocritical. It's double standards. And you cannot be in Kiev and demand that Berlin stops Nord Stream 2. And at the same time, because we have a war in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Ukraine, and we need diesel. We still take diesel from Belarus, which actually comes from Russia, you know, and, and play it that way. We have to be consistent throughout. And what we need as I said initially, principles, but consistency across the board, whether in Eastern Europe or in Western, world, uh, Western Europe. And that is what is missing. You know, Germany is playing its own game. France is also, uh, various states, uh, you know better than me, you're, you're in the center of it, uh, Jody. But what I'm saying is that uh, we have to be effective at all levels of stifling suffocating that regime, but at the same time, offering an alternative to those officers and to, to those officials involved in the repression saying, look, bad times are ahead. The Hague, you know, uh, symbolically courts uh, violations of human rights, but you still have a chance to help out and to topple this regime. How it will happen in Russia, none of us know, but uh, as I've suggested before, the Russia of today on the surface seems to be as strong as ever. The blustering, the Tarzan, you know, troops on, on Ukraine's border and all of that. But in effect, it's a weaker Russia uh, economically, in terms of isolation internationally, in terms of the domestic responses, reception of the messages coming from the strongman in the Kremlin. It's not quite the, the, the Russia of when they annex Crimea. There are even doubts about that in some, in some areas. So, yeah, it's, it may not happen tomorrow, but uh, my response, as I said before, I think it's game over over time, even in Belarus, and that Belarus will eventually join Europe as that long-lost, uh, hijacked uh, member of the European uh, family. Okay, hope it will be as you say. We have another question and uh, then maybe we could uh, go to uh, uh, the topic of your opinion on um, Catalan role on all this uh, mess of international relationship. But right now I have to read this question from Giuseppe Torres who says, sorry, there is a certain parallel between the movements in Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, it could end by the same way in an uncovered civil war? I don't think so. Mentalities are different. Belarusians are much more Baltic. Uh, they're much more Lithuanian, Scandinavian. Ukrainians are, are Southern people. They're much more hot-headed and they will, they will fight if forced to fight. You know, we've had 
the Maidan, we have the Orange Revolution, etc. We have our Cossack history, etc. We are we are people that suffer a lot. But if you if you push us to the limit, we will will stand our ground. Belarusians have been um, law-abiding, peaceful, tolerant, and I think they've come to their moment uh, of, of truth. So. Um, that is the game changer, the change in the mentality. And remember that, that that change has taken place not in the old uh, generation, those you know, survivors from the war. It's the younger people, it's the IT experts, it's the business people, the entrepreneurs, the middle class who think differently. You know? And that's, that's why for the future, um, I don't think Russia has an in there. Uh, I think that Putin blew a very important chance to somehow partly, partially redeem himself in the eyes of the West and certainly in, in, to win favor in uh, Belarus. Had he handled uh, Lukashenko's manipulation of the election results last August differently and said, uh, mm, some doubts, uh, we have to look at this, etc. Let us help you, let us mediate, etc. Instead of coming in and uh, almost immediately uh, saying, we back the legitimate president, etc. He blew his chance there. He had a chance to, shall we say, gain at least uh, the acquiescence, the, the, uh, the goodwill of, of a large part of the Belarusian population. Secondly, uh, Ukraine is a far larger country, regionally very differentiated. Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, Southern Ukraine, Northern Ukraine, etc. Um, less so Belarus, a smaller country. Yes, you have a, a sort of Catholic section on the Polish border, uh, uh, Orthodox uh, center and east. But what I noticed when I was observing uh, the initial protests was that it was not Western and Minsk based, not Western uh, Belarus, meaning Grodno and Brest, but you had protests happening nationwide in Vitebsk and in Mogilov at the same time. In Ukraine, it started in Kiev, it was centered on the Maidan, uh, and then, you know, Western Ukraine were very supportive, gradually Odessa and a few other cities, but Eastern Ukraine were kind of held back until the war started when they realized that they had to make a choice. I am Ukrainian or I'm pro-Russian. And uh, okay, the very far bit uh, were taken over by the Russians and shall we say were encouraged to think differently uh, as in Crimea. But the, the, the game changer there was Russian military intervention where there was a sort of, um, you know, uh, indecision as to, to where to go. What I noticed in Belarus remarkably for a country that we had written off as very Russified, where the, you, where the Belarusian language was no longer important, that it was just the language of some of the writers and the elite. Suddenly, they not only discovered their political rights and sense of democracy, but also they started demonstratively, massively speaking in Belarusian, flying the uh, white, red, white flag, symbolizing that this was not just a protest against, uh, you know, um, a, um, an election that had been fixed, but that this was a national democratic uh, reawakening of a nation, of, of a slumbering European nation. And we lose sight of that in, in Western Europe. We remember what I said an hour ago or 45 minutes ago, this is unfinished business. This is like 1918, this is 1848, this is 1918, this is 19, I don't know, whatever year you want, 1991. This is unfinished business that has taken place a long time ago in other parts of Europe, which is only reaching those parts of Europe because of Soviet rule, the suspension of history, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's important to see, see these things comprehensively, holistically, and not just look at, oh, well, there are Russian speakers in, in Donbass, there are Russian speakers in, in things, so maybe he has a case. And, you know, there are minorities in Georgia, maybe he has a case. And there are Russian speakers in Moldova, 
maybe he has a case and let's not anger him let's let's be fair to to to, to the tyrant in moscow you know whereas we should be saying hey what have we learned from appeasement what have we have have we learned about acting as a body or being played off as uh you know those with our own selfish national interests somebody wrote to me today on a ukrainian uh, site uh no i'm sorry it was the speaker of the ukrainian parliament today who said um and i challenged him in in my comments uh uh mr razumkov he said well national interests above all else and so in dealing with belarus we should always be aware of our national interests and i wrote back national interests well then uh, you know why why criticize the germans they have their national read business interests in Nord Stream 2 are you not uh, uh, interested in higher principles of solidarity in such situations uh, you know we we can't project the image of ukrainians as victims and plead for everybody's understanding and support and at the same time not to pull our weight uh, in, as a team player with the rest of Europe. Yeah. I had some, something about uh, Belarus. Um, I, I think it's not, uh, it's not about telling the Belarusians it's either you are on our side, on the European side, or you are on the side of Russia. It's about being on the side of democracy, on the side of freedom, and on the side of self-determination. And, and I think this should be the main message that we should convey from the European Union, because if we say, hey, yeah, we are with you, but because we want you to, to come to us. No, 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 we want you to come to you. I mean, we want you to self-determinate and then we'll see what happens, but that will, will come after. Uh, first thing is, this is a battle for, 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 democracy, for democracy, for freedom and for your place in, in the world. No? Yeah. And I think sometimes in the European Parliament and the European institutions, we commit a, a mistake saying, yeah, it's our strategic interest. No? It's strategic interest of the European Union to help Belarusians because at the end of the day, we, we want them in. We want them with us. No, we want, we, we want to help them because this is about freedom. And this is okay. about the basic I, I, principles. I fully agree with you. The danger is when you start talking about strategic interests, you resurrect the ideas of bulwarks and buffer zones. You know, which mm. the French used in the 1920s, the cordon sanitaire with Eastern yeah. Europe to keep the Bolsheviks out. I fully agree with you. You have to be very careful in the terminology, the semantics that that are used. I think that uh, you know, Belarusians, like Ukrainians, like Moldovans or Georgians, their right to self determination should be um, encouraged. Uh, encouraged and uh, accepted for what they are. Are they ready for this? If not, accept them for, for whatever status they think is, you know, uh, acceptable for them. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, remember that you have on the other side, Putin, who is telling them, as I said before, you're one nation, uh, you're Russians, uh, you are an offshoot of the Russians, and you're part of Eurasia. You, uh, we are the former Soviet Union. We are the former Russian Empire. How dare you even think under influence of the Poles and Lithuanians, you know, Americans somewhere deep down, you know, hidden, that you, you are different. No, uh, that's why. But we Moscow, uh, you know, we, we know what's good for you, whether politically in terms of the Kremlin or in terms of the Russian Orthodox Church, in terms of your cultural values, etc. So. You have to find a balance uh, between presenting those carrots in initiatives and support without making it seem that you're aggressive, that you're, you want to, to absorb them. And at the same time, you have to counter uh, the, uh, you know, the perpetual disinformation that uh, you don't belong there, you belong with us. And if you belong with us, you're, you're under our hegemony. You know, it's not as if Russia is offering Ukraine or Belarus or others, free equal partnership. You know, it's you come in on our terms and you, you're not a partner. You are a subordinate. You are a junior brother in, in this uh, uh, Moscow-driven uh, enterprise. 
And that's what we mean by Eurasia, and that's why it is dangerous, you know. Uh, and what is dangerous about it is, is that it's threat to, to the West generally, because they see us, those with a different model, uh, a democratic model, uh, as a threat to their existence, not militarily, though they invoke that, but because we represent a different model for citizens, for, for, for people. I mean, look at look look what's been happening in Russia in the last uh, two three weeks. Uh, let's leave Navalny aside. You know, uh, fines against Google, um, closing down of NGOs that are left. Uh, these 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 you know foreign so-called foreign agents, uh, demonizing of anyone who's had grants from the West before as foreign agents, uh, inimical players, etc. I, you know, this, this, this is really not, we're not dealing with an equal, an equal in terms of the, the, the same mindset civilization. We're dealing with somebody who does not want to see us exist as we are, because we pose a threat to them, uh, to, to, to their way of ruling, to their power setup, to their power structures, etc. Um, and that's what's not often realized in the West still. Um, it's sad. I mean, I'm sitting in Barcelona, in this great city of Barcelona in Catalonia, and I'm very privileged to have moved here. Uh, I talk to, to people. Yes, they are obviously concerned about domestic politics and Catalonia and what's going to happen and where it's going to and what's going to happen after the elections, after the new coalition, etc. What legal sort of uh, excuses will be made by Madrid to, to block things or whatever. They're interested perhaps in what's happening in Scotland. Will there be a referendum or not? But Eastern Europe, when I tell them that people are being killed every day still in Donetsk, they say, ah, is the war continuing? Oh, we thought that stopped. We don't know about that, you know. So, uh, <laughs> We live in a world where we have maximum information, and yet it's not quality information. We're kind of, uh, shall we say, swamped by a hose pipe of information, as opposed to quality information that puts things in perspective, that lets us realize what's actually happening and where we belong in this world. It's really very interesting what you said both. Um, now we should start finishing, if I can say this. So uh, I would like to ask you your opinion on uh, the role of Catalonia on all this international context. So what do you think that Catalonia can do uh, in, in all this context or which role Catalonia can play? Uh, well, let me answer as somebody who is, you know, writing on Ukrainian affairs. One of the big difficulties is to make your case known and heard. As I said before, people don't even know by and large and don't really care what's happening in Eastern Europe and on, on the border with Russia. That's a long way away. And by and large, I would say in Europe, uh, after a few weeks of intensive attention, uh, when the uh, Madrid authorities cracked down on your attempts to hold uh, a referendum here, people don't know what's happening here. I don't think your average European, let alone Russian or Ukrainian or Belarusian, know that you have political prisoners, that you have your leaders are in prison. They don't know about the games that have been played, you know, to, to, to stop... Uh, the, uh, a movement for self-determination. Uh, I think, you know, it was clear from what I've seen and what I read that had you lost um, your democratic attempts to define your future, as in Scotland, you have, would have paused, uh, but you were not even allowed that. And this message is not there. And the fact that, uh, let's say somebody concerned about human rights, that uh, diplomatic immunity or depu a deputy's immunity is lifted off of Catalan members of the, of the European Parliament. It sends a very bad signal 
it sends, it gives ammunition to Moscow. It gives ammunition to other states that, shall we say, are not democratic, are authoritarian, because they say, who are you to tell us? Look at what you are doing, etc., etc. And those good examples of some courts in Belgium, Germany, uh, etc., who have not recognized uh, some of the rulings of Madrid are not heard of. So you lose out by being uh, branded, as it were, as extremists. As in Ukraine, we get a bad press when we have ultra-nationalists on the streets and the Western press will say, oh, neo-fascists uh, are active again because Moscow is promoting this in Ukraine. Same here, when you have cars burned here or some, let's say not violent, but shall we say ugly demonstrations localized by a small group of people, but this is presented as an ugly face of you know, separatism in Spain. And I think what, what's needed is a much more concerted effort to win the hearts and minds of, of, of the public, not to say even legal bodies. And you have already a good foundation there that you should build upon because there have been, shall we say, assessments and rulings that, 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 that work in your favor. But uh, I think uh, you need to also link up um, with others in a similar position. I've said before, Scotland is a good example. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the second referendum. They're legally reviewing the situation, well, what, what is possible. But that's a very good litmus test because um, Scotland before was part of the EU because it was part of Britain. Now it's outside. Uh, what, what is Europe about, as I said much earlier on? Is Europe prepared to actually accept notions of self-determination as defined in the UN and uh, charters and, and, and whatever? Or will it just simply um, pay, uh, play up to its member states um, you know, without not wanting to embarrass them or make them discom uh, discomforting. I looked at a little bit at some of the cases. Look, Kosovo, we know the Russians used this case. But the ideal example would have been Czechoslovakia. I mean, a gentleman's agreement, Czechoslovakia deciding in a very civilized way to go their own ways without hating one another, you know, two thirds, one third, splitting up the assets and this velvet divorce. I mean, for me, that, that is, would be the ideal, but of course, Prague is not Madrid. So I, I, I understand that. Uh, Kosovo remains there, Scotland remains there. I don't see any other, uh, you know, immediate examples. Uh, I think that, um, it would be opportune to create a common front with at least the leading players. Uh, and uh, it would be good to see, you know, how the Scots manage this situation and how initially what the initial soundings are from Brussels. If the referendum were to go ahead and if it were to succeed, if, if, uh, what, what will uh, Brussels respond to? Because if they say no, no, then you know that you're in a very difficult situation. I'm telling you obvious things, you know better than me, or you're in Brussels. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think you just need to um, work externally. But somehow you have to work also with the Spanish public. You cannot allow Madrid to uh, present you as, as troublemakers, as, as separatists. You have to invoke your rights. You have to return to agreements that were made earlier in 2006 and taken away in 2010 as a starting point, as a basis. Emphasize what has happened to your leaders uh, and the, the fact that in Europe there are political prisoners of this sort. Uh, but how you do this, I, I, I'm not quite sure. But don't rely on help from, say, dubious sources like, like Moscow. They will use you 
and uh, for their own ends, just as they tried to use, I'm not saying the Catalan movement, but the resistance here to Franco in 37, 38, and then made a non-aggression pact with Hitler in 39, and you know, it was convenient. So I have no recipes, none of us have, but I think the, 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 the obvious things are to, to keep methodically working away, not to lose hope, not to lose sight of, 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 of the ultimate possible um, objective, but to be realistic uh, and to try and get the message across as, 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 as broadly as possible and get yourself out of, the, uh, of being typecast as separatists, troublemakers, a threat, uh, an incendiary force in Europe, you know, that will incite others, Corsicans, Italians, or whatever to do that. Oh, you know, you have your history, you have your, your history of statehood, you have your violated rights, you have agreements that were violated, et cetera, et cetera. I think of all, uh, you know, along with the Scots, you have the most legitimate rights uh, to, to, to be considered. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, That's my personal view. I, thank know. you for your personal view, point of view. Um, remember, remember, look, as somebody from a Ukrainian background, the Soviet Union was breaking up at the end of the 80s, right? Democracy, the Western world, Reagan, the evil empire. When it actually started to happen and the Soviet Union was... Um, dissolving. President Bush Sr. came to Kiev in 1990, I think it was in 1991 early, and gave his, it's called the Chicken Kiev speech, where he appealed to the Ukrainian Soviet parliament, don't rush things, negotiate with, with Gorbachev, uh, you know, it, it might be better for you. And the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, was also the same. Hey, I, I understand you Ukrainians, but Maybe, maybe the Soviet Union is not so bad if it's reformed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So look, what you, you have experienced what, it, it is not the beginning of history and it's not the end of history. Sure. Mm, Jordi, vols fer alguna final, intervenció final? Do you want to make a, a, to say something about that or? I tell you thank you for all and and we go. No, I think I think we can be very grateful for for the messages that uh, Mr. Nahailo just gave us on our uh, on our struggle and 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 how to keep uh, uh, struggling for our for our rights for our fundamental rights uh, and uh, that we never uh, we shall never lose hope but neither lose sight. Uh, and so we keep, uh, we have to, to, to keep um, persevering in our, in, our, in our efforts. And it's true that uh, nobody said that this would be easy. Uh, we know now uh, for sure that it has not be, been easy so far. Probably it won't be easy uh, in the next months or even, even, even years, but um, I was taking some, some notes and I uh, underline uh, one of the things that you said, uh, invoke your rights, invoke your rights. Um, and I think that bridges to, to, to the whole conversation that we have uh, been having uh, uh, in regards to Eastern Europe, but also in regards to our domestic things, domestic matters. This is a matter of rights. This is a matter of uh, fundamental values, uh, and and we have we have to be insisting on this, having a comprehensive uh, approach, and asking for those many um, those many um, involved or those many um, really defending these these values across. The EU, across Europe, across across the world, that hey, uh, here we are. We have uh, we have been 
repressed, we are being repressed for trying to exercise our fundamental rights. And our case is still open, still very much alive and still very much valid. So um, I think your remarks um, make us um, aware of the fact that nothing is lost, that uh, we have to keep going on. Uh, we have to keep our struggle very much alive because it's not only about the case of the Catalans, it's about the case of fundamental rights, about the case of uh, self-determination. So never give up, never give up. Right, if I could just add two or three words, I forgot to mention this. Learning from the Ukrainian experience, but I'm sure this is not news to you. Avoid ethnicization of the Catalan movement. Reach out to all those in Catalonia, make them feel comfortable. Like in Ukraine, we don't want to alienate Russian speakers and those ethnic Russians. Look, we have a Jewish person, Russian speaker, who is now the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, right? Uh, he reached out to many of the Russian speakers and, and shall we say he got 73% of the um, uh, vote in the presidential election. A miracle, I mean a miracle, a democracy in action. Uh, whether he's good or bad, I'm not gonna comment. I'm saying he's, he's doing his job and some like him, uh, some don't, etc. I think what's very important for the future is that people in Catalonia, particularly in the big cities, do not feel threatened by your movement, that they feel that, that they should feel part of it, that they should see the advantages of supporting you. And I think you, you if you're not doing this already, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant, I don't know, but if you have elements within the party or within you, your alliance that can reach out and conciliate um, those who are perhaps are, have doubts or perhaps are hostile to you by making them feel that yes, we are putting the Catalan identity as the central one, but it doesn't, we are building a political nation, a Catalan one, which does not exclude others. You have your democratic and cultural rights within it. You have so many Chinese here now, you have so many Pakistanis here, etc. You have so many Span Sp Spaniards from other parts. Uh, they have to get that message that this is not at their expense, that they are not being threatened. You know, I, I think that's another message I would send, but that's probably obvious to you. Okay, so now I have to do a very pleasant thing, which is telling you thank you very much, Fumbo. Thank you, Bogdan. For sharing, sharing your point of view, your knowledge, your experience, everything. And I hope really that we will continue um, sharing and uh, exchanging um, opinions and points of view uh, and so on. And, and thank you, Jordi, also, because you are always available. And this is very fine because we know that you have a lot of work in Brussels, a lot of work in 